Walmart is notorious for its history of focusing on rural areas, but they weren't the first to see value in bringing discounts to the underserved. Ames tackled that idea years before, and it made them one of the largest retailers in the United States. The following is their 44-year-long history of continuous success, record-breaking growth, and monumental collapse. Ames has been suggested since the first episode of this show. If you want to vote for the next episode, make sure you subscribe and ring the bell for notifications so polls like these pop up in your feed. Now, on with the show. Southbridge, Massachusetts was an old textile mill called the Ames Worsted Company. Worsted is a type of yarn, and this worsted mill was well known, as was its owner, Ames Stevens. The mill went out of business before our story takes place. In 1958, Milton and Irving Gilman, two brothers, were in the process of opening a general store. While looking for a building, they settled on the old Ames place. They liked the sound of Ames, and decided to use it for their new store. Along with their third brother, Herbert, and a fourth partner named Philip Feltman, they opened the first Ames that year. Meanwhile, discount retail was making a big splash. The four watched as the big players of this relatively new industry expanded rapidly across the country. They noticed something odd. None of them were taking advantage of the rural population. Where was all the competition? They were one of the only games in town, and they saw this as a huge market gap, so they decided to convert to discount. Under Herbert's direction, this became their business strategy, opening stores in small towns with little to no competition and offering prices lower than anyone else, thereby taking over its market share. Many stores were opened in the same manner as the first, in converted industrial sites, which saved them a lot of money in real estate. They also had a policy of buying out other companies, which fueled the next decade of growth. In 1962, the four founded Ames Department Stores Incorporated, which cemented their place in the industry. By just eight years later, Ames had 23 stores and over $50 million in sales. They had great prices, and this was ensured by the Gilmans keeping a small budget and cutting unneeded spending. It's important to note that the mill store concept wasn't unique. At first, another chain had a very similar outlook, but they instead opted to focus on new real estate. They were Zaire, another Massachusetts discounter. They became a very strong national brand, and Ames would end up being one of their major competitors. Another Massachusetts discounter was Hills. They started as a regular full-line department store, but converted to discount in the 60s. During the 70s, Ames acquired 47 stores. One such acquisition was Neisner Brothers, which entered bankruptcy in 1977. They had variety stores, but also ran the Big N discount chain. They were in a bind with creditors, and closed half their stores during the bankruptcy. The next year, Ames bought them out and began converting their stores. By 1981, Ames had 115 stores overall. They were only in small towns, or nearby them. Zaire had about 250 stores, and Hills had 83, both mostly urban. That year, Milton and Irving left the company, leaving Herbert as chairman and CEO. Under his leadership, the 80s saw a lot of internal growth and store remodels. King's was another discount chain in bankruptcy. A few years earlier, they sat at about 187 stores. Two years later, Ames bought their 42 remaining stores. Another notable buyout of the decade was that of the G.C. Murphy Company, which had 400 stores, including their mainline variety stores and their discount chain called Murphy's Mart. Unlike previous acquisitions, this one proved much riskier. It doubled their sales and made them an industry forerunner, but this came at the cost of a large debt. At one point, Ames's debt was worth 80% of their entire company value. Converting Murphy stores over to Ames was much more difficult than expected, and stunted a lot of growth. 
There was also a lot of theft, as well as inventory and pricing mess ups. Zare's stores weren't faring much better. The thing with Zare was they had larger, more successful subsidiaries. The most notable were BJ's Wholesale Club and TJ Maxx. Management wanted to focus energies there, so they put all 400 Zare stores up for sale. Ames bought the whole chain for $800 million. At a glance, we had Kmart at number one with 2,300 stores, Walmart at number two with 1,100, and now Ames was the third largest discounter in the country at 700. Herbert was expressly against this buyout, believing it was too expensive for what they got and had resigned in protest. He wasn't wrong. His opinion was a deafening foreshadowing of Ames' future. He passed away in 1990 at just 65 years old. Sam Walton, a longtime friend of Herbert's, called him an astounding and intuitive merchant, as well as a creative visionary leader of his fine company. Like with Murphy, Ames' growth came at a huge loss. Converting Zare was a task even greater. They also had a lot of hidden debts. Meanwhile, internal problems were catching up. Credit was a big problem at Ames. Customers who had poor credit or were in debt were given several extensions and even new cards without background checks. Their stock, which was used to purchase much of Zare, was dropping at a frightening rate. Their debt was rising just as rapidly. That April, Ames filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Steven Pistner came on as CEO and led company restructuring, but he didn't last long. Then they promoted Chief Financial Officer Peter Thorner to CEO in 1992. He did the messy work of getting them completely out of bankruptcy by the end of the year, in the process closing about half their stores. After the bankruptcy ordeal was under control, Ames continued without restraint. Joe Atori was the next CEO, coming from James Way and Stewart's, two other recently bankrupted discount chains. His administration got a little cocky. By this point, Ames had a renowned history of company turnarounds. The problem was they were already overexpanded. During this time was Walmart's invasion of Ames's markets, which saw a major drop in profits. Four years later, Ames announced the buyout of Hills. This one wouldn't leave them so cheerful. Many credited this as the straw that broke the camel's back. Hills was now a debt-filled 155-store chain close to liquidation. It cost Ames about $330 million to buy them, almost all their money. They could have saved a lot by waiting for them to start liquidating, but they were too impatient. This resulted in little to no profit coming from those stores. The Tories' knee-jerk purchase started a downward spiral right into a second bankruptcy just three years later. Ames now had about 450 stores. Again, their debt was almost as much as their company worth. It was clear they could not compete with Walmart. They took almost all their customers, copied many of their policies, exclusive deals, and most of their niche discount practices. Their core markets were destroyed because of a lack of attention. They were the strangers in areas they once dominated. Simply put, they screwed themselves. This time, there was no coming back. Chapter 11 eventually converted to Chapter 7. In 2002, they announced the liquidation of the remaining 300-some-odd stores. Over 20,000 people lost their jobs after having just suffered endless cuts in wages and hours. It was a tough economy with no room for an uncompetitive discounter. Ames wanted to be more than regional, but it was hard to be a loss leader when they couldn't even stock their stores. Ames was one of the last early discounters. Their slogan, we grew up with better values, was true, but they lost their values. The whole point of Ames was to bring discount retail to the underserved. In the 80s and 90s, they all but abandoned that great concept. Sure, they never could have competed without big growth, but they shouldn't have tried in the first place. They noticed a lack of competition out in the sticks, but they eventually went urban, just like everyone else. Out there in the countryside, there would have always been room for Ames.